love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Let's sing our theme song together. Do you, you see April back there? Thank you. Morning, everybody. 
Anybody get struck by lightning last night and live to tell about it? No? All right. No, it seemed like a lot of wind. There's a lot of lightning from where I was, but I'm um, glad everybody's okay and healthy. You been having a good week? Hallelujah. Have, I don't want to put anybody on the spot because it's embarrassing, so don't, don't let yourself feel that way. But has anybody here done, started to implement anything perhaps that you've, you've heard from the information presented? Have you made any small changes this week? Yes. Very good. It's a start, so you live near the area, obviously. Good. Maybe easier for you to do some things then. Folks will have to do it when they get back home. Happy to hear it. Makes a difference, though, doesn't it? Yep. Um, anyone trying to get out in the sunshine or fresh air more, walk more? Um, what else can you do here? <laughs> Anybody, um, now this is a personal question, but have you, have you intentionally tried to find an opportunity maybe to have a few minutes alone with Christ or think about him maybe more intentionally than before? Good. All right. Pardon me? Early in the morning. Yep. That's about the only time you have, it seems, here at the camp meeting. Um, good. The weakness of what we've been doing here together this week has been... Hey, Paul, we need to talk afterwards, haven't forgotten. The weakness of what we're doing here this week is, is by the structure, and I chose, by the way, here at camp meeting to uh, only have one session to teach creation health. I was offered 10, but with the work I need to do and have to get done, I wanted to have only one session. But in addition to that, I'm locked into this structure quite commonly where I go now to different places, so I'm forced trying to teach at least two principles together in a presentation, and I'm trying to learn how to do that better can do it pretty well when it comes to one hour or 90 minutes teaching a creation health principle, but two, that's not easy. And so where the weakness is that you're going to take more responsibility for is on the implementation. Usually we'd spend more time in a creation health class about ways that you can begin implementing that principle in your life starting now, um, which is really the most important part, but this week we've not had a lot of time to spend on that. So I'm glad to see that you're implementing some of those things. Today we're talking about interpersonal relationships and trust in God. I'm going to talk about trust in God first because I don't want to rush through trust in God. And I've noticed this week I've ended up rushing through the second one that I present. So to get us started, I don't know if you have ever seen these clips about our church. But I want to share them with you. A few years ago, while we were in the middle of producing this information, uh, Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle was, lifestyle was featured on um, ABC ABC News, and Good Morning America. And really, although this has been a few years now, it's not gone away with how people view us as leaders in health. This really has helped. So I wanted to share that with you this morning. I'm gonna, the first story, I think, is of, um, she's no longer with us, but it's highlighting somebody in Loma Linda and featuring Loma Linda. So I'm gonna, I think you'll enjoy this. I just want to play. It's like three minutes long. I'm going to play the other news clip, too. Here we go. Let's see. Surviving on faith. Why does this religious community live longer than the rest of us? Our series, Living Longer, Living Better. A new ABC News USA Today poll being released in full tomorrow finds almost two-thirds of Americans say it's worth practicing moderation, exercising regularly, eating properly, avoiding alcohol and stress in order to live to 100. But are there other keys to longevity? Tonight, ABC's Gigi Stone introduces us to a community in Loma Linda, California, that believes it has found the answer. Marge Jetton got her first car around the time cars were invented. At 101 years old, she's still behind the wheel. You go pretty fast, Marge. Uh, fast? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm within the speed limit. At 94, Marion Westermeyer is still perfecting his dive. I don't think I'd be alive if I quit. Could you go out and get one of them? And at 91, Dr. Ellsworth yeah, Wareham is visiting a patient he helped operate on last night. And, uh, it's enjoyable just to continue to be in the field. All are members of America's longest living community, the Seventh-day Adventists of California. The Adventist Church was born during an era of 19th century health reform. 
It has always preached and practiced a message of health. No smoking, no alcohol, no caffeine, no rich foods, and plenty of exercise, like daily walks. But the real secret, members say, is their faith itself. It could be that there's something about prayer, something about the hope that engenders, something about the social support that they get. There have been several studies to back that up. One U.S. government-funded study found those who attend religious services regularly live an average of eight years longer. But not all researchers are convinced. There's no evidence. There's no evidence that there's any medical benefit to religious practices. 101-year-old Marge doesn't concern herself with the debate. She's too busy. You never have enough time to do all the things you want to do. That's right, because you're so slow, it's exasperating. She just renewed her driver's license for another five years. I'm not like this, I'm like this, I'm like this. After all, she needs to be able to get to her daily workouts. Gigi Stone, ABC News, Loma Linda, California. We're, we're finished. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, Marge, I think, passed away a couple of years ago. She's around 105 or 106. But it just goes to show how God can bless your life when you're incorporating his principles into your lifestyle. But let me ask you something. This is, that was ABC News, right? I'm gonna show one from Good Morning America, I believe. Um, yes, next. But what did they highlight as one of the reasons why we're living so long? Going to church, spirituality, religious services. We're becoming kind of known for that. We're known for our dietary principles as well, but isn't it kind of neat to be viewed as leaders when it comes to spirituality? I like it. We should be encouraged. Let's see what Good Morning America. The guy who put us on the map again was named Dan Butner. And uh, this is who they're interviewing in this story, I believe. Another three minute clip. This is Good Morning America with Charles Gibson, Diane Sawyer, and Robin Roberts. And Good Morning America. It's Tuesday, October 25th, 2005. And welcome back. And we're also going to have part of our special ABC News series, Living Longer, Living Better. And this morning, we're going to tell you why people in three places around the world are living the longest. Uh, we've got the man who went to these places and brought back their secrets. One of them, actually, in the United States, and we'll tell you about them. Well, Americans, if given the choice, would like to live to be 87 years old, which is nine years older than the current life expectancy, which is 78. Our next guest has traveled to three parts of the world where people do live the longest to find the secrets of longevity. Dan Butner wrote about what he found in the new issue of Natural Geographic, which is available on newsstands on Friday. And Dan joins us now. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. So the three places that you found, Okinawa. Okinawa. Sardinia. Sardinia. And then in the United States? In, in Loma Linda, California, among the seven Adventists. And we call these blue zones. There's a community of Seventh-day Adventists that tend to live longer there? The highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists live around Loma Linda. And, and we chose as our culture of longevity the Seventh-day Adventists. They live about 10 years longer than the average American, the ones who most strictly follow Adventist way of life. In these three places that you studied, any common traits? Well, you know, we've all heard of the Atkins diet, but the cultures of longevity are ba basically eat a plant-based diet. They almost avoid all meat, or they have very little meats in their diet traditionally. They also tend to be bean eaters, and they also tend to invest very heavily in family and in community. Let's put a huge emphasis on those two. All right, let me start with Okinawa. All um, right. Those, that's the longest living population in the world? It has the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world, so the longest, healthiest living right. people in the world. Right, and what about those on Okinawa? Why? Well, first of all, they don't have a word for retirement. They don't think of life as a time where you work and then sort of stop. They have a word called ikigai, which essentially means the reason for which you wake up in the morning. And it could be a passion for karate. It could be a passion for teaching. And it's that passion that drives them into uh, to age 100 with, with vigor and vitality. Mm. And how about community? Is there anything about community in Okinawa? They have a word called moai, and they tend to travel through life with a little group of friends. It's sort of a mutual support network. Work. And we found studies, we actually cite studies in the National Geographic article uh, that show that people have at least two good friends they can call no matter how bad their day is. They'll tend to live longer than people who are isolated. Mm. How about Sardinia? Sardinia, that's, uh, that's the longest lived men in the world are found there. And it's not all of Sardinia, it's actually a small um, mountainous region that experts call the Blue Zone. 
Um, and at a Bronze Age people live there. They tend to be also very isolated, very focused on the family. And we also know that people who invest in their family tend to have lower rates of depression, lower rates of stress, better heart health, and they also take care of their elders very well. We tend to have grandma and grandpa live elsewhere. In the Blue Zone in Sardinia, they always live with the family. And in Loma Linda, California, where you said there at the end, those who follow the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle, uh, lifestyle most closely yes. live 10 years longer. Yeah. They're, uh, they're largely vegetarian. They avoid smoking. They avoid pork. Um, they have very strong faith. Uh, one day a week, no matter how busy they are, they stop everything and they focus on their God and their family. And we know from studies that people who go to church at least four times a month live as much as two years longer than people who don't. Huh. So faith is probably a good thing to have, no matter what religion you are. There is a faith element in it. That's interesting. Yeah. So you go back and you continue to study all of these? Yes. Uh, in fact, we're doing the BlueZones.com expedition. Next Monday, right. I have a team of experts back to Okinawa That's to flesh out their particular... Again, what did they identify about us? Faith. It seems to me that for so many years, we have been, it seems like a few people have been tempted to be ashamed of, our, of their faith, of talking about spiritual things. Ashamed might be too strong a word, but it's interesting to me that in this new age of wellness and health, they're seeing us as someone who has something to say on this issue. Um, I'm going to talk uh, kind of, I'm uncomfortable that this is being recorded, but I'm going to talk to you. Uh, because we're here together with this experience this morning. I just want to say some things as we go through trust. Uh, we're talking about trust in God. We're talking about faith and spirituality. And I think it's important for us, and you may disagree with me, and if you do, that's fine. I, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to say we need to be very clear on what spirituality is and what it is not. If I decide not to drink a glass of milk and you drink milk, I'm no more spiritual than you are, okay? Okay. We have taken our health message, I believe, in certain lifestyle practices with our health message, and we've turned certain aspects of it into moral, to, to morality, to moral issues. And we've blurred that with spirituality. And that is not right. We need to follow the example the Bible gives us, particularly the example of Jesus Christ. In fact, I remember a story of my uncle telling me, he preached on you know, the disciples after the resurrection where Jesus and John, was it John 20 or 21, made breakfast by the sea, and it was a fish breakfast, and he ate it with him, after his resurrection, and he got, uh, he got chastised after he preached that sermon. And uh, he, told, he told a nice dear lady, he said, Sister, it's right in the Bible. Now, my uncle is Ron Halverson. He's retired now, but if you've heard of Ron Halverson, then you know that he speaks his mind quite freely, in fact, even more so than I do. And uh, so he shared it with her, and she got mad at him. And this was at a camp meeting. And she said, well, Jesus didn't have the spirit of prophecy, <laughs> you know? So it's something I'm sure she wasn't even thinking about when she said that to him, that Jesus didn't have the spirit of prophecy. The point I'm trying to make is when it comes to food and nutrition, do not make moral issues out of things the Bible does not make moral issues out of. All right? Because these wonderful people that God has seen fit to open a door for us to have an influence into their lives, they don't know what we know when it comes to health. And they don't understand sometimes the subtleties of what we say, and they might see a person stand up and, and go preach against, you know, meat eating and dairy and all that stuff, and they might think we are talking spiritual things there. We're not. You know what? When it comes to spirituality, we need to leave Jesus Christ on the cross. Put him there. We don't need to put a glass of milk or a slice of cheese or even if you eat a hamburger. You know what? The Bible says if you want to eat meat, it's fine to eat meat. Here are the meats that you can't eat. Here are the meats that you shouldn't be eating. You know what I'm trying to say? This is important to me as we talk about spirituality today because I hate the idea of people the Holy Spirit is bringing to our churches and we, out of good intentions perhaps, do things that might not be the wisest. They end up pushing them away. That's not good. You have a question? Is what? Pork and seafood, according to Leviticus? I would say, according to the church, the church would say yes, that would be, because that's a part of the unclean uh, meats in Leviticus 11. You know, but you know what? It's just not us talking about the unclean foods these days. Have you heard of Joel Osteen? Osteen, he's a preacher. It's on on Sundays. Despite what people say, I like him. I listen to him once in a while. He's a good guy. Um, I was watching one of his sermons talking about the unclean foods. <laughs> this guy in that arena was preaching on health 
And that night, I was tuning in on Sunday night. He was preaching on nutrition, and he told his folks in that 40,000-seat basketball auditorium, he said, folks, we need not to be eating pork and these shellfish. He went on down the line. I would have sworn somebody gave him an Adventist uh, sermon from an Adventist preacher on Leviticus 11, you know, and he went into why people shouldn't be eating this stuff. You know, it's just not healthy. So, you know, we have other people that are saying it. Um, I'm just saying when it comes to spirituality, don't turn things into um, spiritual issues that the Bible doesn't turn into spiritual issues. Okay, understand what I'm saying? My jealousy is over souls that God wants to see in his family, and I want us to be very, uh, I want us to be wise and loving and kind to not work against the Holy Spirit. And I think people work against him, uh, and they do it with good intentions. They're not trying, nobody here wants to run anybody off. There's not a single person in the Adventist church who wants to run somebody away from the church, I don't believe. But sometimes the way we do things, now we present things, drives people away. So take a stand on the things the Bible says to take a stand on, on the issues it says, you know, back off, well, back off. That said, we do have something to say about health, and we know what we're talking about when it comes to health. That said, people have free will in many of these areas, and whether they choose to eat like you or not, that's up to them. They're not any less saved if they eat a hamburger on the way home from work and you don't. They might not live as long, but they're not any less saved, you know? All right, so let's just get into this. I just had to say that, felt compelled. I can say it. You're not going to have your pastors here say that. Your conference administrators aren't going to say it. I can say it because I fly out tomorrow. So, All right, we're talking about trust today. And um, I hope you have your outline. We'll go through that in a minute. You know this text, one of my favorites, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And how many of your ways? All your ways, acknowledge him, and he will do what? Make, make your path straight. So the question is, what's your trust level this morning in God? Don't, an, don't tell me. Answer to yourself. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much do you trust him? Really, in your own mind, you know. A 3? 7? I mean, how much? And what type of God do you think you're actually trusting? I mean, who is God to you? What's your viewpoint of God? I'm only going to cover a few slides when it comes to trusting God, and that's one of them we're going to get to next. Studies show, though, that if you trust in God, have a relationship with him, you extend your lifespan on average by seven years. It's 14 years if you're African American. And the number of reasons why this takes place. One is because when you trust him, have a relationship with him, you tend to choose a healthier lifestyle because you value the temple more. Uh, usually when you have a trusting relationship in God, you're connected to a community of faith. When you're connected to a community of faith, you have a support group. So you're not isolated and alone, which means you're not falling into coping mechanisms that would deteriorate your health in order to try to manage your isolation. So there are different things that work together to increase your lifespan when you have, a trust, when you have trust in God as a working principle in your life. Now, here's what I want to get to. It depends, though, on what your view of God is. And I imagine what your view of God is depends on how you were taught when you're younger or the authority, religious authority figure in your life when you came into, came into the church. Faith in a loving God, a loving God creates positive wellness outcomes. But if you have faith or trust or believe in a God who's punishing and exacting and stern and critical, you'll actually have negative wellness benefits, negative outcomes. In fact, they did a research study, and there's so much here, but I'm only going to highlight this. Listen to this. It says, patients who reported feeling alienated from or unloved by God, listen, or attributed their illness to the devil... Okay, so we have three things happening. Patients who felt alienated from God, unloved by God, or attributed their illness to the devil. Now, you and I know the devil is behind all illness, right? I mean, he created it. God didn't create it. But for patients who actually attributed their illness, actively attributing it to the devil, here's the outcomes those three groups had. They were associated with a 19 to 28% increased risk of dying. So if you feel alienated, if you're a patient and you feel alienated from God or you're unloved by God or you said, I'm going through this illness because the devil gave it to me, you increase your chances of premature death as a result of that by up to 28%, almost 30%. So my feeling is, I hear this all the time, you know, when I'm traveling and people do it out of the goodness of their heart. I know what they're trying to do. But they, they, they kind of call out Satan in their prayers. You know, we bind your hands, we do this and that. And God did give us power over the demons, right? The people he sent out. That said, I think we give too much attention to the devil. 
I don't think he deserves the spotlight, quite frankly. What's he done to deserve it? He's done nothing. He's just ruined this world. He's trying to ruin our lives. Who deserves the spotlight is God, his power, his grace, his love, his restoration, his redemption, all of that. I mean, Satan is craving for your attention today. And if he can get your attention in a prayer for 15 seconds, you just made his day. It's sort of like a, like a plant. You know, if you don't give it what it needs, the sunshine or water, it just withers. Let him wither away out of your life. He's unimportant. He means nothing. And there isn't any power that he exerts on your life that your Father in heaven can't overcome and exert greater power. There are angels right now working in your life, trying to save your save yourself from yourself in some situ situations. They're trying to encourage you. They're trying to have positive influence, spiritual influence on your life. You have all of heaven at your disposal. You don't need to give a second thought to the other power in this world that's taking place. I know Paul says we fight against you know, powers on high, and we have that language in our Bible. We know it's true, but don't focus on it. Don't dwell on it. We have a God who is able, a God who's able to heal, and all of those things. I just thought it was interesting that a person's view of God determines their health, how healthy that they will be. There is a, actually, there's actually an effect attributed to whether you view God as loving or punishing. Uh, they've studied households, 560 families who prayed together. They tended to be happier, more satisfied. That makes sense. They've taken teenagers in high school. Those for whom religion and spirituality is important, they find that they eat better, they exercise more, they have better grades, they don't get into as much trouble, uh, and less high-risk behaviors, which is something we want, and they actually sleep more. We've got to talk about forgiveness. You can't talk about trusting God without talking about forgiveness. Um, they took, I'm trying to figure, we, we have a great book called Forgive to Live. You can go on to Amazon and, and get it. Uh, it's just a great, great book that Florida Hospital Publishing has produced. Dick Tibbetts, maybe you've heard of him. Awesome. They've taken people who have been hurt and wounded, and they've asked them to rehearse that experience in their life. And what they find is, is when they have them hooked up to machines and everything, their blood pressure goes up, their pulse raises, all of those, the stress response increases in their life when they rehearse how they were hurt. When they take them through a class of teaching them how to forgive who hurt them and to forgive themselves, because sometimes you have to forgive yourself because you were the cause of the hurt and the pain, when they take them through, in the studies they've done, when they take them through nine hours of forgiveness training, researchers found that forgiveness lowered stress, boosted feelings of self-confidence, and created greater feelings of community with others. It says participants also reported fewer headaches, backaches, and upset stomachs. The point is, when it comes to forgiveness, I know the person who hurt you might not deserve to be forgiven. What they did was wrong in many cases, and the last thing you want to do is forgive them. But what you need to know is this. The only person you're hurting is yourself. They might no longer be on this planet. They're at Disney World enjoying their life, and you're sitting there rehearsing what they did to you sometimes 60 years ago. And all you're doing is making yourself sick, miserable, and unhappy. So you know what? Maybe they don't deserve forgiveness, but you deserve forgiveness. You deserve the effects of what that forgiveness is going to do. And maybe they hurt you so badly that you are going to have to forgive them more than once. Trust me, it happens. I don't think you can forget. I know they say forgive and forget. I don't think so. I think you know when forgiveness is kicked in, it's kicked in when you can remember the incident and you're no longer hurt emotionally over it. All right? So you know what? I've had people hurt my family uh, pretty significantly. And so what I've had to do uh, and, it, and some things happen, you know, one thing in particular I'm not going to share, it happened back in the late 80s. So that's over 20 years ago, right? I have no feelings toward it anymore, but what I found myself doing was I had to forgive that person over and over and over again. I didn't want to. I hated that person. So I had to tell Jesus, Jesus, please forgive that person for me. You forgive them for me in your grace. I found it took years to get over that. But I was intentional, and maybe I'm just weak. Maybe you can say I'm not authentic. Whatever you want to say or not say about me is fine. But I do know this. I was, I was benefiting from the wellness effects of that forgiveness process. And I deserved that. I didn't deserve to be miserable and my health to go down because of something they did to me that was totally wrong and criminal. So if you have an issue in your life, 
that's making you miserable and you know they don't deserve forgiveness, just say, Jesus, forgive them for me. And you pray that prayer as many times as you need. It's going to come like grief. It's going to come in waves. You're going to be okay for a few weeks, maybe three, four months, and then it's going to hit you again. You're going to relive that memory and you're going to be miserable and dark and gloomy. You pray, Jesus, forgive them for me. Snap yourself out of it because you deserve it. You deserve the, the wellness benefits of forgiveness. Got to forgive. Let God deal with what they deserve, deserve or don't deserve, but you need to forgive them because you deserve to be happy and well and healthy and happy and strong. They find that trusting God when they've, done, when they've done tests, it lowers, it decreases these diseases you see on the screen. In fact, this is a pretty impressive study. Researchers reviewed 1,200 published studies when it comes to health, and they found that trust in God, based on these 1,200 studies, decreases all these diseases. So if you'd like to have less cancer, trust in God. If you'd like to have uh, less coronary ar ar artery dysfunction, trust in God. If you'd like to live longer, trust in God. And another one, along the same lines, this study, this is amazing. These researchers looked at 42 independent samples representing nearly 126,000 people. And they said at the end of researching these 126,000 people, they have found, and these are not Seventh-day Adventist researchers. These are scientists. They said they found that if you trust in God, you've increased your chances of living longer by 29%. After studying nearly 126,000 people. That's not Loma Linda saying it. That's not the church saying it. That's scientists saying it. I thought it was kind of interesting. The first video we saw, got that guy from Columbia, there is absolutely no connection between religiousness and living longer. And then they segued right into Loma Linda church service. I liked how ABC kind of handled him a little bit, you know? It's like they brought him in because they had to, because that's what good journalism is. It shows both points. But the story was showing that guy, he didn't know what he was talking about, didn't it? Exactly. And these studies do the same thing. I find this fascinating. Duke University did a study of people 55 years and up. They wanted to track them for five years. At the end of five years, they wanted to see if they could identify if there was a single reason why they were still alive at the end of five years of that study. And they found after five years, the one independent reason why they were still alive was attending religious services. They took into account how they ate, their exercise patterns, their relationships, you know, their lifestyle. And at the end of, fi end of five years, that was the one Duke University now identified as the one reason why these people were still alive. Amazing. Attending religious services. All right. We're gonna, we need to still talk about interpersonal relationships, so let's wrap this part up. Uh, I would encourage you and myself to give some thought to our walk with God and to developing a deeper, more trusting relationship. You know, Elijah, I was at the pastors this morning for worship, and we're talking about Elijah. You think that guy had his act together? Man, he prayed, didn't rain for three and a half years. Uh, James talks about him as being a man of faith, and that's, and Ellen White says, you know, that's the type of faith we need that will pray and be at heaven's door until heaven answers. I mean, he prayed, it didn't rain, then he prayed and fire came down. And you know what she says in Prophets and Kings? Love the chapter on Elijah. I can't remember the chapter, but if you have time to read it over the weekend, read it, Prophets and Kings. She said the one thing he had to learn <laughs> was to wholly trust God. It's because he didn't fully trust God that he ran from Jezebel. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if my dear hero Elijah had one thing to learn, it was to trust fully in God, then I think that's probably something I need to learn as well. Because I put Elijah like way up here and myself way down here when it comes to that God thing, that faith factor. So I, I would invite us all to give some thought to the level of trust we place in God. And then start talking to him just like you would as a friend, we're told in the spirit of prophecy. Talk to him as you would a friend throughout the day. He already knows what's on your mind and heart. Nothing you're going to say is going to upset him. Nothing you say is going to surprise him. Nothing you're going to tell him is going to make him think, oh no, we have a problem that I can't handle. Let's talk to him. Get off your chest. Develop a, a trusting relationship. Give him your worries. People carry too many of these things right here. God can fix it. He can show you, if you as you cooperate with him, you'll find a way through for you. Trust me. Give them your challenges. Give them your dreams. Make them your best friend wherever you go throughout the day. Spend time in his word. You just can't pray. You need to spend time in his word. It seems to me like 
you know, some people I just pray and don't read the Bible. Some people just read the Bible and they don't pray. And those are terribly unbalanced people when you meet them and talk with them. It seems like the pray only people are so, you know, shallow. And it seems like the Bible only people seem so rigid and stern. What you need is you need both. You need to pray, you need to study. And a third thing you need to add to that, that we need to add to it, and preaching to myself, you can't just pray and you can't just study. The third element you need when it comes to developing trust in God is you need to reach out and help somebody. Because that's really the laboratory where we learn to apply what we've read and what we prayed. When you're helping somebody who's in trouble, it's going to take you to your knees, man. And you're going to be forced to figure out how the Holy Spirit needs to fit you to help that person with their life. My dad, when I was growing up, he did crusades in, in Canada, and um, I was fascinated. I don't know what it was in Canada, but uh, it seems like almost every crusade, there was some conflict with spiritualism. And I remember one night, there was a guy that had been attending the meetings in Ottawa, Canada, and my dad, and um, I think Lawton Lowe was a speaker for that one, I'm not sure, they had to go spend the night with this guy because he was in the occult world, and they had threatened that they were going to kill him because he was, becoming, he was looking at becoming a Christian. So they had to go sit with him all night, my father was telling me a story of seeing a, uh, either a knife or a hatchet just fly by itself through the air toward that guy. You know, so you go and you help people. You're in that situation, which is an extreme situation. I remember other situations in Canada where the evangelist was trying to, he's going to baptize a lady. The demon, she had practiced, you know, she was in Satanism, wouldn't let her down into the tank. She couldn't move. And then... I mean, the pastors and everybody was praying, and all, all, suddenly she was thrown in the baptismal tank. When she was in the baptismal tank under the water, they couldn't get her up out of the water. And so they were praying, you know, and all out of this stuff. And finally, the force let go of her, and she came up out of the water, and they were able to baptize her. And it was like a, an instantaneous change when you saw the power of God come in and the power of evil go out. But let me tell you something. We talked about evil earlier where we don't focus on evil. Don't get me wrong. Evil's alive in this world. We rub shoulders with it every day. I just don't like giving it uh, the feature on the news story at night. That said, since we're dealing with that sort of stuff, we must be prepared. And when we deal with people and helping them in those situations or whatever situation of life they might be in, it might be a, you know, a single parent who's working two jobs, whose kids, since they're never there, are going off in a direction that we know is going to lead to a bad place. It might be dealing in that situation. But if we don't get out and try to help those kinds of people, which God has called us to minister, to help people through their life, then reading the Bible and praying is not going to make any difference anyway. Because we're, we're called to be active and to do something. And that's a part of trusting. That's part of developing a trusting relationship in God. So if you know a lot scripturally, and if you pray a lot, and you still feel like your trust isn't where it needs to be, go Pray, ask your pastor, ask somebody you trust what you can do to make a meaningful difference in your community, either to somebody in your church or somebody in the town, okay? I mean, you, if you feel weak on your trust, go help somebody, and uh, you're going to be uh, brought up to speed pretty fast as the Holy Spirit equips you, all right? Connect with the community of faith. It makes no, I mean, that's, makes, um, that's not rocket science. At the end of the day, God is putting it in your hands to decide the priority you're going to place on him and the relationship you have with him. You're in charge of that. So that's trust in God. Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. You'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I like the new living translation there because it really reflects the Greek really closely, and I enjoy that translation. So that's new living translation. Okay, let's go over the outline before we breeze through interpersonal relationships. Outline, many of the answers are taken from the DVD. Des does our presentation for trust. So none of these were covered in my presentation this morning because Des does his own thing on the DVD. He does his own thing because he, we feel like you can't, it's hard to have, a, it's hard to record a, you know, scientific DVD on why you need to trust in God. You have people coming to the Creation Health Seminar. They know that we have something to say spiritually, but you don't want to try to convince them through science and all that other stuff. We do that with our slides, but what Des did, and it's genius, he actually offers a devotional for the Trust in God piece on our DVD to kind of warm up the hearts and open the hearts for the message that's to come. So that's why that DVD is different than any other DVD we have in our series. But the first blank is, full freedom requires full trust. Des talks about that in length. Full freedom requires full trust. If you see the DVD, that'll make sense. 
Second, God, and this is the same word repeated three times. God is always with you. God always forgives you and always loves you. He's always with you, always forgives you, always loves you. The next blank. God's promises are a dimension of trust. I was reading this morning in the devotionals. We should lay hold of the promises and not let go and press them before the throne. God's promises are a dimension of trust. And the, ne- the last three blanks are easy. How do you build trust and faith? You claim God's promises. Claim God's promises. You live God's promises. And prayer. Prayer is the dynamic of trust. So you claim God's promises, you live those promises, and you pray. And I should have put something in there on helping others. I need to do that next time we do this outline. Because if all you do is claim a promise and pray, and you don't live to help somebody else, you're missing out on a wonderful experience. Okay, you with me on that so far? All right, good. Did I manage to offend everybody in the room? No? Good. Hope I didn't offend anybody. I hope you know that I love you, and I'm here as your brother in Christ. We're all one family, and we all have our points of view, and not all of us are, you know, my points of view aren't always right. They're not always accurate, but in my heart, I want to see people be part of God's family. So if you can say something that's going to make me more effective, then tell me. And if I can say something that will make the church more effective, I'm going to say it. All right, interpersonal relationships. Dr. Dean Ornish, this is the guy known for reversing heart disease. When asked about the most powerful influence in a person's life with regards to health, and specifically this, you know, their heart problems, you'd think he'd say low-fat diet, um, you know, stress programs. But what he says is, Nothing has a greater impact and influence in your life, even with regards to your health, health of your heart, than unconditional love. Unconditional love. In fact, there is a book written by Prevention Magazine, I guess, and they have a, a, a reference in there. A, they cite a source that says that um, it appears that something physically, physiologically happens, biologically happens at the cellular level when a person begins experiencing unconditional love and changes start taking place in their lives. But not everybody experiences unconditional love. One-third of the people in this country report feeling lonely. It gets worse than that. Uh, 25% of Americans have no one to confide in. Um, Loneliness is a major disease. It says 29 million people are living alone. What's the next slide? I think it's the one I want to get to. Yes. There's a three to five times. Well, go back here. 25%. You know what that means? That means as you're walking down the sidewalk, hopefully it doesn't mean at church, but as you're walking down the sidewalk, One in four people you pass potentially is a person who's isolated relationally. One in four. That's a big number. Now over here, if you have loneliness, you've increased your risk of heart disease by three to five times. Um, And we talked about this the other day. Increases premature death by up to 500% if you feel lonely and isolated. I heard someone make a, a joke about the church. I hope it's not true. They said church is a place where we all come to be lonely together. I hope that's not the case. But if at church, if all you did at church, if you looked around and asked the Holy Spirit to lead you to somebody who might need some encouragement, some, you know, uh, uplifting, and you went and you smiled and shook their hand or hugged them if it's appropriate, you could be, ch- you could be saving a life. Do you realize that? You don't have to know the timeline in the 2300-day prophecy to make a difference. You can go over and let somebody know that somebody noticed them and you're making a world of difference in their life. Why are they dying 500%? Why is the risk so high? Well, when you're lonely, you want to you cope, and you want to manage it. So you fall into all these different things you see on the list. Overeating, overworking, depression, overwork. We've got to say something here about this. It seems like Seventh-day Adventists have a pretty good work ethic. Oftentimes, I think Adventists are workaholics. A lot of times, that's because, face it, there's more to do, it seems, than we have people to do it, Right? Ellen White lost her husband much, much sooner because he worked himself to death, didn't he? And she had some things to say to the church about it. So overworking is not a virtue, not something to brag about, not something to uplift as a standard. Um, All of these things can increase premature death by 500%. And usually people use those things as coping mechanisms to escape the pain of their loneliness. I mean, look at it this way, too. You could have a couple. You don't even have to be, do you have to be alone to be lonely? 
Do you imagine that it's possible in this country there are marriages in which the husband and wife feel alone and lonely? Yeah, so if you have a, a marriage that's in trouble and the couple feels loneliness because they're not connected anymore, do you think it's possible that one or two of them could start engaging in these behaviors? Yeah, and if you're an Adventist, you're probably not going to take drugs and alcohol or smoke. You might overeat a little bit. But one thing that we do and do well is we overwork. So if things aren't going well in our families, we feel safe doing this, and we like bragging about it. Anyway, just a commentary. They did a study on loneliness, and this is considered to be, I believe, the definitive study. Yes, definitive study on social support and the risk of death. And what they have found in this study it says people classified as lonely and isolated had three times higher mortality rates. People who were classified as lonely and isolated said people with many social contacts had the lowest mortality, and the amount of social support was the best predictor of good health. Now listen to this. I have here a quote, so I'm going to quote it. Now, this study took place over 40 years. A 40-year study. We're not fooling around here. This is serious, a serious study. Here's what they say. Social connection helps prevent premature death. It is more powerful, it is a more powerful predictor of health and longevity than age, gender, race, social economic status, self-reported physical health status, and health practices such as smoking, alcoholic beverage consumption, overeating, physical activity, and uh, utilization of preventative health services, blah, blah, blah. So what they're saying here is it's an independent factor over and against all those other things you think you would do to stay healthy, you could be doing all of those other things to stay healthy. And what this is saying is if you feel lonely and isolated, guess what? You're going downhill. So I'm glad we have a church family, and I get to travel a lot, and so does Jennifer. I tell you what, no matter where you go in the world, the church is the church. And you feel like you've just walked into a family. I'm glad we have the family that we have. And the things I've seen in the research, and I can't say this <laughs> decisively, but some of the preliminary stuff I'm seeing coming across my desk is, it's interesting, you know, that a lot of these benefits, um, and we're going to talk about corporate worship in a minute, are only experienced within uh, a church environment. They don't seem to be replicated in a small group environment, say in your home or something. It doesn't really make sense to me, so I don't have a lot of confidence in those statistics and research, but I'm just letting you know that there's, I'm trying to make a case the way we have our church and our families, and we're part of this faith community, there's something to be said for it that's producing benefits to our health and happiness and spirituality I'm not sure we, we really fully recognized through the years. So stay a part of your church and help to encourage other people to get connected to it. One thing they know is when social support decreases, your immune system goes down. If you have more friends, your immune system goes up. I have some studies I could share. I don't have time. They looked at people 100 years old to see why they were 100. And these are the common things that they identified, researchers did. What do you see on there? Socially connected. They're all socially connected. I mean, Marge was connected to her church out there in Loma Linda. Social connection. Cancer patients. Essentially, the study is saying that those who had cancer and went through support groups lived longer than those who didn't. In fact, I find it very interesting. There's a doctor who got mad at another doctor, and he set out to prove that this wasn't true. It says, uh, Dr. Spiegel intended to disprove the idea that psychosocial interventions prolong the life of women with breast cancer. Now, he was upset because his name was Spiegel, and he was constantly being confused with the other guy, who's Dr. Bernie Siegel, who Siegel is always preaching this sort of thing. And Spiegel was sick of being confused with Siegel, so he said, I'm going to put my own research together and prove that guy wrong, put myself on the map, and have him being confused with me instead of me being confused with him. So he set out on a research study, <clears throat> talked to Dr. Ornish about it, and he put women, breast cancer women, survivors, into groups. And uh, this is what he says. He says, I quote, he says, I finally got around to looking at the data, and I almost fell off my chair. Those women who had the weekly support group lived an average of twice as long as did the other group of women who didn't have the support group. All of the women in the comparison group who did not have the support group were dead after five years. The only women still alive were those who had received the weekly group support sessions. He says also the time from the first metastasis to death was significantly longer and those had received the weekly support groups. So he told the, his research, was, which was originally intended to disprove this, 
he now became a champion of the role of relationships and social connection and support group in getting, hell, getting well and healthy. So, when you go to church, try to make it a point to connect with people. I don't think it's enough just to show up. You've got to engage them. What predicts positive aging at the age of 50? A good marriage or low cholesterol? It's a good marriage. You might have good cholesterol and a bad marriage, and you're going to have a negative outcome with your aging. Ideally, you want a good marriage and good cholesterol, right? But it's interesting to me how a social connection will compensate for the other. That's how God made us. Healing touch. People enjoy regular touch, have stronger hearts, blood pressure's lower, stress levels are lower, tension's reduced. I can't, I don't have time to go into it. Um, I talked about this the other day, babies who are touched for 15 minutes a day, three times a day. Six days less in the hospital, save $3,000. Do I have it here? This is what I want to tell you about. They had a, some twins who were born prematurely, and um, one of them wasn't doing well. They were in the neonatal, it wasn't at our hospital, but they were in the neonatal unit, separate, and, and one was doing well, the other one, her blood oxygen levels were low, her breathing was not good, uh, she, the outcome didn't look like it was going to be a good one, all right? So the nurse was looking at these two kids, and hospitals up until this point never, ever, ever, ever would put two siblings in the same incubator together. But she, got the, she just had a hunch. And she talked to the parents, got their permission. They said yes, put them together. And their names are Kiri and Brielle. They're born 12 weeks early. And so she took and put, um, she said she took Brielle, which is the healthy one, out of her incubator and placed her in the incubator with Kiri, whom she hadn't seen since birth. Now listen to this. Immediately, Brielle calmed down. Her blood oxygen levels improved, and she began sleeping better and gaining weight like her sister. And it says occasionally Kiri would put her arm around her sister while they slept. And it says, Brielle fully recovered. This was such a significant event that it changed hospital policy across the nation. Now when siblings are born prematurely like that, they will put them in the same incubator together because they found that they get, we have more positive outcomes with that. Isn't it? It's kind of cool. It's kind of neat. Now, if you don't have a person around to enjoy that social interaction, that hug, that handshake, get an animal. Pet owners, they've shown... Only 6% of the pet owners died after having a heart attack. It says one year after being hospitalized with chest pains or heart attack, only 6% of the pet owners died compared to 28% of patients who did not own pets. Thing was, that was independent of how they ate, how they exercised, how they lived. It was the pet that was identified as the reason for them still being alive. They took men. They wanted to see what effect a good friend or a dog would have on their blood pressure. And what they found was that... A, a dog that they had a relationship with lowered their blood pressure more than their good friend lowered it. And you know why? The dog was non-judgmental. It was seen as an un a source of unconditional love where the friend, although he was a best friend, still had his opinion about the situation. So don't underestimate the role of a pet if you're able to have one and the influence it can have on your health. Very, very interesting. Now, tips for healthy relationships as we wind this down. Have open communication, time for one another, healing touch. They say you need up to 12 hugs a day just to be healthy. Four just to survive, but 12 to thrive. Forgive one another. Pray for those who hurt you. Have a positive attitude. Be flexible. Number eight, don't play fair. If you want to have a healthy relationship, you cannot play fair. What often happens is someone comes into our life, could be a spouse, could be a child, could be a church member, they say or do something that hurts our feelings, and oftentimes, what does that do? It makes us close off, shut down, and go into silent mode because we don't want to be hurt by them again. So we start distancing ourselves from them, don't we? And that's kind of, that's kind of playing fair. They did what they did to us. We distance ourselves, and in distancing ourselves, we begin kind of treating them the way that they treated us that triggered this situation. But the thing is, will you ever get healthy or recover from that situation if you use that process. No. So you can't, play, but it's fair. They hurt you, so you're not going to allow yourself to be hurt again, and you might hurt them. That's playing fair. But you can't play fair if you're going to have a healthy, strong, happy relationship. You have to engage that person. You have to risk being vulnerable and be hurt again if you want to have a healthy, happy relationship. 
That's probably the most important thing of all these slides on interpersonal relationships is don't play fair if you're going to have relationships that create the kind of outcomes that God intends for us to enjoy. If you play fair, you both lose. If you don't play fair, you both win, likely. John Rockefeller Jr. says that giving is the secret of a healthy life, not necessarily money, but whatever a person has of encouragement, sympathy, and understanding. This guy was a mess. His employees hated him. His employees were burning him in effigy in the oil fields. Death threats were made on his life. By the time he was 50 years old, all he could eat is milk and crackers. And when he was 53 or 54, his physician said, you're going to be dead within the year. He was a recluse. recluse. That triggered him to make a change. He started investing his wealth in libraries and in hospitals. He found, uh, the, um, he found cures for different diseases. I don't have them with me here. I forgot the sheet. He got rid of the hookworm in the South. I mean, he, revel he, he, he has such a historic role to play. The things when you go study his life, what he did after he's told he's going to die in a year. He started investing himself into people and into causes. He had a purpose. So let me ask you this. There's more to that story. I don't have the time to tell you. I just want to ask you, and you don't know probably unless you've done the research. He was 54, 53 when he was told he's going to die in a year. Do you have any idea at what age Rockefeller Jr. died? He was 98 years old. He was on his deathbed at 53, started connecting with people in the world after 53, trying to make a difference. And that social connection, that purpose, that meaningful existence he had after that, had him live almost another 50 years. He died when he was 98. So I encourage us all, and I'm preaching to the choir, because I'm about as introverted as, as you can get. I know you don't see that here, but I am. Um, we all need to connect, and here's some ways we can connect. Send a card, call someone, set a lunch, hug someone. I had a pastor tell me that when he was pastoring New England, smaller church, if someone was sick, he would pass out uh, cards during the church service and have everybody write a note about how much they missed that person. And so that person <laughs> would open their mailbox the next week, and they'd get a few dozen cards letting them know that they were missed. He said it just lit up people's lives. My counsel to you is, remember it's better to eat Twinkies with your friends than broccoli by yourself. Okay? You will not hear that in any other health seminar, I'm quite sure. Because friends are the most important thing of all. Let's do the answers and you can go to lunch. Tomorrow we're going to do Outlook and I'll be our last one. I cannot wait to share that because it's my favorite one. The answers. In 1985, on average, each of us had three people we could confide in. Three people in 1985. We've been teaching this now for three years. It's just made the news about two months ago. By 2004, that number had dropped to two people. Two people. Today, 25% of Americans have no one to confide in. Good relationships improve improve our life. We've seen that. We've gone over it very quickly. There's a lot of research I left out, but you get the idea. Good relationships improve our life. Down at the bottom, the last two blanks, healthy relationships mean healthy children. We have a whole section on children. Um, healthy relationships mean healthy children, and um, loving touch promotes good health. If you watch the video this afternoon, you'll see a study on that. Loving touch promotes good health. All right. You know, tomorrow, hopefully, I say hopefully, we'll have maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes to take some questions. Um, we've been rushed through these presentations, so we've not had the time to really take some questions. But tomorrow, we'll try to leave some time since we're only doing one, one presentation tomorrow, okay? Uh, let me pray for you, and uh, I want to say thanks for being here today, and hope the rest of your day is a blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for creating this way that you created us. We thank you so much that to you, social connection, relationships, companionships, are, it's just something you, you prize so much, you value so much, you enjoy so much. You created us to enjoy us. And Father, we enjoy you. And we realize that you don't want to possess us. You don't need us. You just want us to be in your life. And we love you so much for it. And today we invite you to be a part of our lives. We want you 
to walk with us everywhere we go. So bless my friends here, Father. Bring healing to their heart in the areas where there's pain. May they experience your grace. May they sense very profoundly that you're walking beside them today, everywhere they are, that they are never, ever alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. See you in the morning.